Okay, let's get started. So, hi, I'm Stefan T. Lowey, and for the past eight, almost nine years, I've been working on VC's STL implementation. And I'm here to talk to you today about Functional, uh, which is a header that existed all the way back in CS Plus 98, but has expanded dramatically, uh, possibly more so than any other header in the standard library, um, through CS Plus 11, 14, and the upcoming CS Plus 17, uh, some people who are pessimists refer to it as CS plus 1Z. I'm an optimist. I think it actually will be 17. Uh, so uh, a couple things to get started. Uh, please hold your questions until the end. Uh, if you have a question about a slide, I have slide numbers. So write them down, you know, put them on your phone, and then at the end you can ask about that slide, and I can go back and we can talk about it. Um, also, uh, everything I'm going to talk about today uh, is standard. So it'll work regardless of what implementation you use, as long as it conforms to uh, the standard. Uh, there's only a couple implementation specific things that I'll be mentioning, um, and I'll point those out as they come along. Um, and uh, in VS 2015, I overhauled functional and support machinery, so everything I'm going to talk about today is available right now in VS 2015 RTM uh, with only a couple exceptions, and I'll mention those at the end so you know exactly what's available and what isn't. Um, also, every feature I'm going to talk about, I've tagged with the standard revision. Uh, so if for some reason you only have access to CS plus 11 or CS plus 14, um, rather than the full everything that's coming in CS plus 17, uh, you'll know what will be available. So although this talk is about the standard library's functional header, uh, I want to start by talking about lambdas. Uh, this is sort of prerequisite for understanding everything I'll talk about later. Um, so they were added in CS plus 11, and in CS plus 14 they, beca they became more powerful with init captures and generic lambdas. So this is what a lambda looks like. Um, shouldn't be too surprising unless you have not used generic lambdas before. Here um, I've got a vector strings and I've initialized it with some stuff. And I want to I sort them, uh, but not lexicographically. Instead, I want to sort them by their lengths. And I'd like to sort them stably, so preserve the original order when the lengths are the same. Um, so I could write this even in CS plus 98 with a handwritten function object, but with a lambda, I can do it all in a single line, um, wrapping for the slide. Uh, and here it's very simple. I simply say, here's a lambda, and I take L and R, and I return whether L size is less than R size, and this just sorts them by their size, and I can go print them out. Um, all of my uh, code examples here are real code that will actually compile uh, if you include the necessary headers, put a using directive, and an int main. Um, the generic part of this is that I say const auto ref. Uh, there's no reason for me to rep uh, repeat string, and this would, the lambda would continue working if for some reason I needed to change the type to uh, U16 string, U32 string, or W string, any of those. There's no reason for me to repeat the type there. So that's a lambda. Uh, but I've noticed that many programmers, when they, they start using lambdas, they get some very strange ideas into their head. Uh, they think that lambdas are some sort of magical thing. And the way that I think about it, lambdas do something very simple. A lambda expression, which is what you type in your source code, does exactly two things. It defines an unnamed class, and then it constructs an object of that type. Uh, possibly initializing some data members, which are their captures. So the lambda syntax is very convenient. As you saw on the previous slide, I could cram the functionality of, oh, just compare these strings by their size um, into essentially a single line. Uh, but it doesn't grant you physically new powers. You could always have done this by writing a function object by hand. Uh, the problem is that it would just be more verbose, and you would have to put the definition outside of the local context of where, wherever you're invoking the algorithm. So the lambdas are convenient, but they're not magical in any way. Um, also, I've noticed a lot of confusion. Um, lambdas, they're a core language feature. They're part of the compiler, and they're available without including any standard library machinery. Uh, machinery. They're not std functions. They can be stored in std functions, and we'll go over that at the end of the talk, but they are not std functions. So if anybody says, oh, a lambda's a std function, you need to correct them. No, they're not std functions. They're completely different. Um, Lambdas do have a couple tricks. Uh, if you have a stateless lambda, it can be converted to uh, ordinary function pointer, uh, but that's not super magical. You could write a conversion operator by hand if you know the syntax and you have a type def for the uh, function pointer. So remember, a lambda, it just defines a class, constructs an object of that class. It's a class type. It's not a built-in function. It's not a function pointer. There are some people, evil people, who refer to lambdas as anonymous functions. Do not do that, or I will make this space. Seriously, they're not anonymous functions, they're classes. Okay, so that's the core language feature. For the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk about the standard library. Um, so instead of doing it in chronological order, talking about 11, then 14, then 17, I wanna present it in logical order. 
Um, and the story begins with invoke. And now invoke is a function in CS plus 17 that you still need to understand it even if you're only using CS plus 11 and CS plus 14. And I need to introduce a, a couple of bits of terminology. Uh, terminology in books and articles is all over the map. People talk about function objects, functors. Um, the standard, though, has very specific terminology. So in the standard, a function object is an object type that is usable like a function. And there's three things that fall under this banner. Uh, one is function pointers. Now, even going all the way back to C89, thanks to the wisdom of Dennis M. Ritchie, um, you could invoke a built-in, you know, a plain function pointer just with parentheses. DMR basically looks at that and says, okay, in C, generally, I map everything directly to what I'm going to compile, what the machine's going to execute. But if you apply parentheses to a function pointer, what else could you possibly mean but dereference this thing and call it? So I can just do that for you. This is one of the very few times that C just does something helpfully for you. <laughs> um, and in CS Plus, we now have the ability to overload operators. So if you have a function call operator on a class, it's callable like a function. Um, CS Plus 98 used this extensively. And lambdas count as function objects of class type. Um, also, if you have a class that doesn't have a function call operator but is convertible to a function pointer, the core language is sneaky and says, oh, I can call that too. Um, and that counts as a function object as well. Uh, now, the standard doesn't consider references to be object types, but if you have a reference to a function, you can form that. Um, you can also call that like a function, and there's one place reference wrapper where this matters. So I think of them as function objects, but they're not technically objects. Then the standard introduces the terminology of a callable object. So a callable object is something that's callable in a generalized sense. So not just a function object that's callable with parentheses, uh, but also a pointer to member function or a pointer to member data. Now, you may never have seen these before in your life, but they exist all the way back in CS plus 98, and they allow you to select a member function or a data member of an object without knowing what the object is ahead of time. But the syntax for doing so is very strange and also has the wrong precedence in some sense, because you have to wrap the PMF in parentheses before you invoke it. It's awful. Um, now, the, the reason the standard library introduces this terminology is because the core language has different syntax for these pointers to members and function objects. Now, in theory, there's no reason why the core language couldn't do what DMR did and say, oh, if you try to call a PMF with parentheses and give it an object as the first argument, what else could you possibly mean but say dot star? Uh, but the core language is not helpful. Uh, they make you use different syntax for this. And that's really awful. Uh, so the standard library says, OK, I'm going to compensate for the deficiencies of the core language. And I can just invent my own awesome world. Um, and this awesome world is called invoke. Now, this was an imaginary function that didn't exist, wasn't available for users all the way back in TR1 in 2005 and CS plus 11 and 14. But there was a proposal that was recently accepted in CS plus 17 to make it an actual function that's callable by users. So what does invoke do? You call invoke and you give it a callable object as the first argument and then a bunch of arguments for the callable object. Uh, if the callable object is a function object, then it's just called with parentheses, very simple. But if it's a pointer to member function or pointer to member data, invoke uses template metaprogramming and it detects what it needs to do. And it's very intelligent. Not only can it distinguish between PMFs and PMDs, but if you give it a reference to an object versus a raw pointer to an object versus a smart pointer to an object, invoke will just do the right thing. Um, it has five different expressions that it can compile. It also is aware of base and derived pointers to member data. If you think about this, it's really nasty, uh, but invoke just does it all. Um, and it's extendable in the sense that it knows nothing actually about smart pointers. Um, so you can call it with a unique putter, a shared putter, or if you have your own user defined smart pointer, as long as it's dereferenceable, uh, invoke will work with it. So if you have a CCOM putter or some QT smart pointer or something, invoke will totally work with that. Basically, if it's not an object, it assumes it's a raw pointer. Um, so here's an example of usage uh, where you might actually want to use it in your own code. Uh, now, this is not a super helpful function, but at least it does something. Um, here, I'm writing a range-based algorithm, and what I want to do is I want to iterate over every element, and I want to transform it according to some callable object, and then just print it out. I could also insert it into some sequence or something, but I figure I'd just print it out. Um, so here, I write transform print, it takes const range ref, it takes a callable, Traditionally, in STL, we call objects by value. I could do it differently. Um, and then for every element, I just call invoke, and I give it the callable object and then the element. 
And by doing this, I can now call my transform print function with either a function object like a lambda. Here I have a lambda that takes a pair and squares its first element. Or I could pass anything else that fits the definition of a callable object, like a pointer to member function or pointer to member data. Uh, technically, in the standard library, you can't take the address of a standard library member function, but you can take the address of pairs data members. Um, so I can print out the second element of each pair uh, just by passing a PMD. And invoke just does the right thing. Whereas if I tried to call C with parentheses, then the lambda would work, but the PMD would fail to compile. Um, so the reason why invoke is necessary is going all the way back to C++11, many things in the standard library use invoke. And here's an exhaustive list of everything in the STL that uses invoke. It's a bunch of stuff. Uh, I'll be talking about all the stuff on the left column uh, today. The things on the right in the multi-threading headers also use invoke. Um, so once you know, oh, I can use you know, PMFs and PMDs like this, um, you can give them to things like call once or std thread. And because they follow the invoke protocol, um, it'll just work. Okay, so some recommendations. I promised I'd be talking about proper usage in addition to just what the stuff does. Now, if you don't write generic code, then invoke is not super useful because if you know the type of your callable object, you also know the syntax needed to invoke it. Um, but if you really, really hate PMF syntax, like you just cannot type paren obj dot star PMF paren paren args, um, and you know, I have some sympathy for that, then you can use invoke, you know, it, it'll just do the right thing. Um, but invoke really shines in generic code, um, where you can just take and potentially store arbitrary callable objects and arguments that you need to give to it, you give it to invoke, and you let it decide what to do. This is very simple to do, and we use it now in the standard library's implementation. Don't try to write helper code to detect PMFs, PMDs, and dispatch on them. It is an absolute nightmare. PMF types are the worst types by far in the core language because they can be CV qualified, they can be ref qualified, they can have ellipses, you've got base and derived, it is nasty. So you just give them to invoke, uh, let your standard library implementer deal with the headaches. So that's uh, invoke. And even if you aren't using CS plus 17, you still need to know how it works uh, because everything else in functional, almost everything else, uh, uses it. Okay, so result of is actually not technically in functional, but we need to talk about it because it's strongly associated with invoke and things that speak invoke. And it gained a couple powers in CS plus 14. Uh, so result of is the type trait that corresponds to invoke. It actually did live in the functional header back in TR1, but it got moved to type traits, which is probably where it does belong in CS plus 11, and has remained there since then. Uh, so the first thing that everybody tries with result of is they try to ask, okay, what's the result of this function object? You cannot ask this question. It is a compiler error. And the reason why is because the result of invoking a callable object depends, in general, on the arguments that you give it. For example, a function object could have a templated function call operator, especially like a generic lambda. Uh, it could have an overloaded function call operator. So you need to ask, what is the result of invoking this callable object with so-and-so arguments? And once you provide the arguments, then result of is defined as the decal type of an invoke expression. And the standard says it's invoke called with decal val callable. Decal val is this imaginary function uh, that lives in the STL. It's actually declared and provided to users, but it's never defined. It doesn't physically exist. Um, it exists only for the purposes of decal type to say, what if I had an object of this type? Uh, I've actually had users complain, I can't call to decal val. Um, and the reason why is it's not implemented. I love users. They keep me employed and entertained. <laughs> uh, and in CS plus 14, a result of gained a power that if you say callable with args, but it's not actually callable, um, the double colon type will sphene away, and you can essentially ask, is this thing callable at all? In CS plus 11, it was a hard requirement that the thing be callable, and then you could get its type. So here's an example. I had to think really hard to show an example that was somewhat natural and not simply superseded by auto and decal type auto. Um, so here, I've got another sort of transform function. Here I'm uh, coding it to work only with vector of t. And I'm going to take another call arbitrary callable object. What I want to do is I want to transform each t element, e each t element of my vector um, through this callable object. And I'd like to push it back into another vector. Then I would like to sort the transformed elements and return that. So I need to be able to ask, what is the type of calling the callable object on my t's so I can make a vector of that type, sort it, and then return it? 
Um, and just to avoid repeating code, I'm going to use CS plus 14 auto return, but I could span out the vector to KT, blah, blah, blah. Um, so the way that I call it is I have a vector string. I have a lambda that's just going to take a string and return its size. I'm here to sort of avoid CS plus 14 overload. I've, I've made it um, just take a hard-coded const string ref, but I could say auto there, const auto ref. Um, and then I iterate through the transform vector and print it out. So the crucial bit I've highlighted here, what is the element type of ret? I need to ask, what's the result of invoking callable ref on const t ref? But that callable object might return, say, a const int ref. I can't have a vector of references, and I can't have a vector of const ints either. So I need to use std to kt, which is a type trait, um, that will strip off references and top-level CV qualifiers so I can get a vector of the non-reference CV unqualified type of whatever it returns. So this works, and it's perfectly generic. Um, but you'll notice I had to say callable ref and const t ref there. The result of is actually surprisingly tricky because it answers, you know, what's the type of this invoke expression, but it uses radically different syntax from the actual call. If you look back at the example here, I said invoke lowercase c comma t, but the syntax for result of was totally different. And you have to verify that they correspond, and that's actually surprisingly tricky uh, because the CV qualifiers and the value categories that you give to an invoke expression, value categories as L valueness or R valueness, they matter. Uh, functions could be overloaded to do different things based on the constness or the value category. And in CS plus 11, you can have ref qualified member functions. So functors, function objects, can be sensitive to whether they're L values or R values. And if you get it wrong, it may appear to work, except if somebody calls you with a sufficiently weird argument, it would fail to compile. Um, and also, if you are not just using invoke directly, but something like bind, then bind manipulates its arguments before calling invoke. Uh, so async does decay. Resultive will not do any of that. Uh, so you would need to do such transformations by hand. I've seen people try to use resultive when they're actually giving something to bind. And that, in general, is incorrect. I can give you a placeholder, and now your result of is incorrect. Uh, result of, it dates all the way back to TR1, which was a library-only addition to CS plus 9803. It was extremely useful then, before we had decal type um, and all this L value, R value stuff. Um, but it really has not kept up with the times. So what I recommend is avoid using result of. If you can, use decal type directly. There are some cases where you do, you don't never need to use result of, because you could always write the decal type by hand. Sometimes result of could be convenient, but just be careful if you use it. And if you have existing usage in your code base, go back home, go look it up in your source control, and I bet you you're going to find bugs. Look carefully at the value categories that you're giving. For example, um, in this code, if I simply said result of callable paren t, that would be incorrect because it would be asking what is the result of invoking an r value callable on an r value t? And that could be different from the actual invocation, which is invoking l values. Um, so you may find bugs in your code. I've seen too many to count. Um, I recommend just using decal type directly or auto. And if you're a generic programmer, you already need to know that stuff. So it's not an extra burden of understanding. Uh, the general principle here is if you need to compute information, don't do it through different mechanisms. And if you need to repeatedly compute it, and sometimes that's necessary, um, try to just exactly repeat text, because at least you can verify that by looking at the source code. If you need to do some sort of mental transformation uh, to verify this one thing corresponds to this other thing, um, you're very likely to get it wrong. And even if you get it right, it's going to be more work than necessary. OK, so that's. Result of. Now let's talk about memfin, which was added in CS plus 11, uh, replacing some older stuff that I'll talk about later in CS plus 98. Uh, so here's usage. I didn't even bother to actually invoke count metals. It's pretty simple. Um, I have a, a structure class, and it's got a member function that returns a bool. Um, and then I want to use an STL algorithm and have it call that member function. So I'd like to call count if on every element of a vector uh, and ask, hey, are you metallic? Now if I just tried to pass a pointer to member function, a PMF, it would fail to compile. And the compiler error would say something like, I can't call this PMF with parentheses because the core language hates you. Um, and <laughs> the, the answer um, is you can just pass it to memfin. And memfin is a function in the standard library. It takes a PMF and wraps it in a function object because STL algorithms expect function objects, not arbitrary callable objects. And then this allows it to be invoked with parentheses. So this is actually very convenient. Um, but it actually breaks down if you look at it real closely. So the, the good thing about Memfin 
is that it's very terse. Um, it's usually not possible to write less code than just memfun address class double colon blah. Um, but it has some downsides. A hidden downside is that it's actually going to make your code slower most of the time because it needs to store that pointer to member function as a data member. And optimizers have difficulty seeing that a data member of a class was initialized to some constant and then used later. Um, at least I talked to VCs back in devs and they said, wow, that's a pretty, pretty fundamental limitation in our optimizer. We might fix that, but don't expect it you know, anytime soon. Um, I don't know what um, the other compilers do, um, but certainly if you write such code, it won't be portably optimizable. And in any event, you're going to make the optimizer work harder than it has to. Also, in general, this will not compile if the code is weird enough. If the member function becomes overloaded, then simply saying address of the name of the member function is now ambiguous and you need a static cast to disambiguate which one you want. Same thing if the member function is templated. I talked in an earlier talk, you don't want to use explicit template arguments there. You need to use that static cast. Uh, to be really general and it's just awful to type that thing. And if you have default arguments, the signature of the thing isn't actually corresponding to what's going to be invoked. Um, so it breaks down as soon as the code is extended. Um, and I've also observed people doing things like calling memfin only to give it to bind. But bind already speaks invoke. So you don't need to wrap PMFs when you give things to bind or std function. Um, so if something is in this CS plus 11 functional stuff, you don't need memfin at all. You only need it um, or something equivalent when you're talking to something like STL algorithms from 98 that expect function objects with parentheses. So my recommendation is to avoid memfin. Now it's not super horrible. You can use it with a pretty clear conscience. Um, but the thing is, if you're giving a member function to an STL algorithm, you probably care about the performance because it's going to call that for every element of your uh, sequence and it's going to be maybe a million elements, who knows? That performance may matter. Um, and the fact that it just breaks down when code evolves, that's pretty inconvenient. So now that we have CS plus 11 lambdas and 14 generic lambdas and so forth, what I recommend is writing a lambda to call that member function for you. Um, yeah, it'll be a little bit more typing, uh, but it's going to optimize away because the body of the uh, lambda is just an ordinary function call operator. And the optimizer can totally see through that and inline that without having to figure out that some data member is always some particular PMF. And it continues to compile because it's just an ordinary function call. Okay. Um, so another feature that was added in CS plus 14 are, is the transparent operator functors. Um, they're not actually named so in the standard. That's just how I think of them. Uh, here's a quick example. Imagine I had a vector int filled with stuff, a vector string, and if I wanted to sort them in reverse order, uh, std sort has always defaulted to std less. Uh, that sorts things in ascending order where every element is less uh, than the next element if it's different. Um, if I want to reverse it, I need to pass greater. So in CS plus 98 and 11, I would have had to say greater int and greater string. In CS plus 14, I can simply omit the type and just say greater empty diamonds. Um, I need to say the diamonds because it's a template and I can't omit it. I really wish I could. Um, but you can just omit the type and you can just say sort by greaterness. There's no reason to repeat the type because the compiler already knows, hey, this is an iterator into a vector ints. And then I can just print them out. So I've talked about this at CPCon 2014 and going native 2013. So you can look up those uh, talks they, and slides. They go into extensive detail about the transparent operator functors and they enable a cool trick in the containers called in the map and set family called heterogeneous associative lookup. So I won't spend more time on that. Uh, my recommendation is to use the transparent diamond operator functors by default. There's no reason to repeat that type. The only case you would ever want to use the old style greater t and so forth is if you want implicit conversions to that particular t before calling the operator. And that's extremely rare. It's usually undesirable um, because if you don't perform those conversions, you're going to make yourself immune, which is good, uh, to things like truncation bugs. My usual example is, what if I'm sorting a vector of u and 32s and I pass greater u and 32, and then later the vector is changed to be u and 64? If you don't change your comparator, then every time you invoke it, you're going to get a conversion which truncates from 64-bit to 32-bit. It'll happily compile and it'll limit a truncation warning maybe, um, but that's bad. It shouldn't compile in the first place or it should do the right thing and the greater diamond does the right thing. It also avoids efficiency problems like temporaries and copies. 
Now, you might be asking, okay, what's the difference between MemFun, which I'm saying is not so cool, and the transparent operator functors, which I'm saying are cool? And the difference is that the operators, in some sense, are all known in advance. There's a finite list, you know, less than, greater than, plus multiplies, and the library can provide perfect definitions that are templated to accept arbitrary stuff, they return arbitrary stuff, they don't store any data members, they're not vulnerable to all the problems of MemFun, which has to work with a pointer to member function or data that's not known in advance. So that's why these operator functors are good to use and MemFun is not so good to use. So now let's talk about bind. Uh, bind was added in TR1 and CS plus 11 and it's remained. It has not really enhanced in power, um, since then, there are, have been some proposals to extend bind. I'll, I'll go on about what I think about that. Um, here's an example of using bind. And bind is actually pretty terse when you look at it. Uh, but you gotta learn what it does. So here I've got a, a bunch of ints, and I wanna count how many are less than 50. Um, so I can say bind less, and here I can just say less diamond, but I could also say less int. And I need to say is underscore one less than 50. And underscore one is a placeholder. And what this bind expression does is it makes a function object that binds less and leaves the first parameter unbound, and that will actually be provided by each element of the sequence, but it binds the second one to always be 50. So this function object is gonna ask, is one less than 50? Is four less than 50? Is nine less than 50? And so forth. Um, if I reverse the order of the parameters, I'm gonna ask, is 50 less than the first element? is 50 less than the second element, and so forth. And I'll get different answers because there's different numbers that are less than 50 or essentially greater than 50 here. So that's what bind does. So I tried to fit and I succeeded all of what bind does onto a single slide, but it's a pretty dense slide because bind does a ton of stuff. Um, and if you've not implemented bind, it can be sort of overwhelming, especially look at, if you look at the standard ease. So, for completeness, I did want to mention what bind does. You give bind a callable object, and then you immediately give it arguments that will be bound to it. Um, like here, I'm gonna bind underscore one and 50, but I could also fully bind it. I could say bind 49 comma 50, and then I would get a function object that takes no arguments and always calls less with 49 and 50. Not super useful there, but elsewhere it could be useful to bind all arguments ahead of time. Um, later, you call B with any additional arguments, and those are called the unbound arguments. So bind needs to store this stuff somewhere. And the way it's specified to work in CS plus 11 and beyond is that it copies or moves them depending on their value category and stores them as data members. Then when it calls invoke, either conceptually in CS plus 11, 14 or physically in CS plus 17, they need to be passed as L values. And this is surprising, so I've put it in bold. They're passed as L values because once you have a function object like B, um, you can call it multiple times. And if they were passed as R values, then they would be moved from after the first call. And then you'd be all, why is my string getting emptied out? Why is my pointer, you know, smart pointer getting nulled out? That would be bad. So they're passed as L values. Um, also with B's constants, and that implies that the function call operator is overload. Um, so some bound arguments are special. Like I've mentioned, underscore one means fill me in with an unbound argument. Those, unlike the bound arguments, which are copied or moved and then passed as L values, the unbound arguments are perfectly forwarded at the point of each call. Um, if you pass a reference wrapper, it gets unwrapped. We'll talk about that later. And if you have a nested bind expression, which is, I would say, by far the most insanity-inducing thing in all of the functional header, um, those are called with perfectly forwarded unbound arguments. And bind also has this weird little thing that's kind of unusual. Um, you can pass more unbound arguments that are, than are necessary. Um, any ones that aren't used, whether they're at the beginning, middle, or the end, they're just dropped on the floor and completely ignored. And there are some arguments for why that's good. It's kind of weird though that the STL is just willing to ignore unbound arguments. But that's how bind works. Um, so bind has many, many issues. I've seen lots of people use bind because it seems to be terse and it was good back in like 2005. But it has surprising gotchas. So first, it's got all the performance issues that MIMFIN does because it stores the callable object as a, as a data member. So if you have a pointer to member function, pointer to member data, or a function pointer, which bind works with, it needs to store that as a data member so it's gonna be resistant to optimization, it's gonna be fragile if the thing is templated or overloaded, you'll need to disambiguate, which is awful. So same issues. But then also, if you misuse bind, um, either by giving it the wrong stuff or by making an invalid invoke call, it will emit an awful compiler error. 
Now, many people, they're like, oh, I use the SKL and I get awful compiler errors. And they're basically wimps. I'm going to say they're not really that bad. You know, yeah, compilers can be confusing, but you learn how to deal with them. You know, get over it. Yeah, yeah, concepts will make things better. But they're not that awful. But with bind, bind errors are awful. I'm a standard library maintainer, and I just cannot bear to look at a bind error, even if I wrote bind. It's like, ugh, awful. Um, you'll just throw up your hands and, and give up. And that's because it has so much library machinery to mess with the placeholders and the reference wrapper and the unbound arguments and ugh. Okay. So also, when you call bind, the syntax that you give to it is not ordinary CS+. You need to learn this sort of bind mini language. Um, you need to learn it, how to write it, how to read it, and that's bizarre. Um, especially with nested bind. Right? You're basically delaying invocations. Whereas if you write a lambda function, its body, once you get past the introducer, um, you know, the square brackets, um, it's just ordinary CS plus. You just call ordinary member functions and you know how that stuff works. Also, that whole bit about bind, passing things as L values is deeply surprising. I have seen multiple people confused by the fact that they're passed as L values. And this means that, for example, if you bind a unique putter, stuff won't compile because it's being passed as an L value um, and a unique putter is not copyable. Um, I've seen, I, I guess I can mention some names just to reinforce here. I've seen both Herb Sutter and Scott Myers confused by bind. And these are very, very smart people. But bind is even more evil than they're able to handle. Um, I was confused by bind. While uh, maintaining bind, I thought, oh, I can just pass them as R values and that'll make it efficient. And no, stuff gets stolen from. Uh, that broke Windows and I had to revert the change. Uh, <laughs> that was very bad. Uh, I, I have a test case for that. It's called grand theft bind because bind was stealing from its bound arguments. Very, very surprising. Um, the only reason I knew about this issue is because I ran into it myself. Um, their bind is not obvious on when it calls things immediately versus when things are called later. Uh, this has impact if you're calling something like a time function that's sensitive when it's called or if it's looking at some sort of global state that's changing. Whereas with a lambda function, it's very clear what happens when the lambda is constructed. That's all the stuff in the init captures. And when the lambda is called, because everything in the function body doesn't happen until you actually call the thing. And then actually, I've never seen anybody run into this, but it sort of nags at me. Um, if you write a bind expression and it's sufficiently bizarre, you can actually move from arguments twice. If you repeat placeholders or if you have enough nested bind expressions. I find that extremely dangerous in theory because the STL generally is not willing to move from things twice unless you go out of your way to do something so dangerous. But bind will happily do it because it was invented before our value references. And then it was, our value references were added on later. Uh, so very dangerous. So what I recommend is, and this is stronger than memfun, avoid using bind. It's just not worth it. Use lambdas. It may be tempting to use bind because bind will sometimes be shorter than a lambda, but the verbosity of the lambda is worth the price, or it's the terseness of bind is not worth the price of it. Um, usually in the STL, we like library solutions because they can provide a more abstract solution in the core language, but bind is essentially a counterexample. We tried to make building up function objects in the standard library all the way back in Boost and TR1, and it just doesn't work well. And that's why lambdas were proposed and added to the core language, and they've been, they've been extended since then. So don't use the STL in this case, use the core language. Okay, so I mentioned uh, reference wrapper. Um, this actually, it lives in the functional header. It doesn't always need to work in functions though, um, but it has one useful power, which is why it lives in functional. Um, so here, it's such a small class, I've actually put the entire class definition um, up on the slide. Reference wrapper to T is in some sense, it behaves like a reference to T except it's assignable, so you can reseed it. The other way you can think about it is it's an auto dereferencing pointer. Um, so it's got an operator T ref, so it can convert itself to a reference, or you can explicitly ask for dot get. And reference wrapper also has this extra little bit. It has a function call operator that takes arbitrary stuff and then invokes it, um, uh, invokes the T on whatever is given to it. Um, so a reference wrapper to a function object is callable like that function object. You can also have a reference wrapper to a PMF or PMD, but that's very obscure. So here I've got an example of usage. Imagine I've got vector ints, and I would like to fill it in with randomly generated numbers from 1 to 20. So I can define um, d20, which is a function object 
that every time you call it, it will generate a random number and it contains a random number engine, a, a uniform random number generator, and a distribution. So the function object is stateful, and every time you call it, it's going to modify its state and then return a random number from 1 through 20. So if I use the CS plus 98 algorithm generate and I call it with D20, it'll seem to work. But then if I call it again, I'm going to get the exact same sequence of numbers generated. And that's because to generate takes its function object by value, and you get a copy. So when I copy D20, the new object, the, the copy, is invoked and modified, and then it's discarded. And then if I make a fresh copy, I'm using the original state. That's why I get the same sequence of numbers. Um, if I use stdref, which is a, a helper function that makes reference wrappers, then I will directly invoke the original object D20 that I've got here, and I'll get a different sequence of numbers every time I call it because I'm only using that original object state. Uh, so it's more efficient, and it actually does what I want, which is usually good. Um, so, because CS plus 9803 algorithms, almost all of them, the only exception is std shuffle that I can think of, um, take function objects by value and are allowed to copy them, and 4-H is also special, um, but most of them can copy function objects. If you don't want to copy, you can and should use std ref to ask the STL, oh, pass this thing by reference. Just put it in a reference wrapper and then invoke it later. Some people, and I get bug reports, they try to use explicit template arguments to make an STL algorithm take a function object by reference. And that'll work on some implementations, but not others, and it's not portable. SI algorithms really are allowed to copy function objects, so you should use reference wrapper in this case. The standard even has a note saying use it here. Um, it's also useful elsewhere, even if you're not working with function objects like std thread, but you should be aware of why std thread wants to copy things before telling it no, don't copy things. Um, also, uh, reference wrapper, is unwrapped by a few functions in the STL. Uh, make pair and make tuple, uh, notably, uh, are aware of reference wrappers. So if I say make pair or make tuple, and if I give it reference wrappers, it will return a pair or tuple with built-in references. And I've got an example here. So if you've ever wanted a pair or tuple of references, you can now get that easily uh, with reference wrapper. Okay, so I'd mentioned earlier that Memfin had superseded something. This was stuff that was available in CS plus 9803, and in CS plus 17, uh, they have been removed outright, and this was at a very recent meeting. Um, they were deprecated all the way back in CS plus 11, so compilers could have been warning, hey, they're deprecated. And in the standard CS plus 17, they have been removed outright. So the things that were removed in functional were the classes unary function and binary function. These were just helpers that would provide type defs, result type, argument type, first and second argument type. There was a function putter fun that would wrap a function pointer and provide the type defs. And then there were things mem fun with a u, mem fun ref, don't ask, uh, bind first and bind second. And these have been superseded completely by the TR1 and CS plus 11 mem fun and bind. So because these things have been officially removed from the standard and at least in my implementation they're going to be removed at some point, um, you should never ever use this stuff. If you have existing usage, you should start transitioning away from it. They have been deprecated and removed for a reason. They're not general, um, they're hard to use, they've been superseded, things like that. Um, in fact, I've seen lots of people using them when they weren't actually necessary. Um, they were needed, these type defs, like result type, argument type, they were needed for adapters, like bind first and not one, things like that. Um, but if you're just giving function objects to STL algorithms, or STL containers like stdmap, they have never needed any of this unary function, binary function stuff. So if you had function objects deriving from unary function, or if you were calling things with putter fun, you probably didn't need to do so. And you can eliminate it and make your compile times faster and your code simpler and all that. Um, now, I wanted to break the world, but I couldn't quite do it in one release. So in VS 2015, we still provide all this stuff by default. Um, but you can define a macro project-wide, and this will simply pre-process away all the stuff that has been removed. So if you would like to join the new world order of not having all this removed stuff, um, you just define has auto putter, et cetera, to zero. This will also uh, turn off the definitions of auto putter and a random shuffle, which were removed at the same time. Auto putter is extremely dangerous, don't use it, and, but this talk is not about auto putter. Okay, so finally let's talk about std function. Save the best for last. This was added in CS plus 11, and it has gained extra powers in CS plus 14 and CS plus 17. So here's an example using std function. Um, std function can do lots of things. Here the example is recording a sequence of actions in a vector and then playing them back later. So here I have a vector of functions, 
And these are going to be callable with two ints, and then they're going to return another int. So here I can store things like a plus function object, a multiplies function object, a pointer to function. Here I've said address some squares. I could have just omitted the ampersand and it would have worked as well. Um, I can also store things like lambdas. Here I've got stateful lambdas that capture the integer i and then go use it later. And then once I've built up this vector of functions, I can iterate through it and call it with arguments. In this case, I'm always going to call them with four and five, but I could call it, I could iterate over repeatedly or do whatever I want. I can also do things like store a std function as a data member and then use it later. Okay, so std function, you should think of it as a wrapper. It doesn't do anything by itself. What it does is it stores a callable object of some arbitrary type. Now, the type of the call object, it could be a lambda, or it could be a function object that you've written by hand, or from the STL, it could be a PMF, a PMD. The type of it doesn't matter, only the signature matters. Uh, the std function is templated on the call signature. I take args and I return ret, and it erases the actual type of the callable object. That's why I can have a vector of such things. Here in the example, std plus and a pointer to function and a lambda, they're all different types. I cannot have a vector of different types A, B, and C. They all need to be the same type, and that's what std function does. It erases the type of the call object, and like a Cheshire cat, it preserves only the smile, only the call signature. So this is useful when you can't have code that's templated on the type of a callable object. Um, lots of different contexts. It could be code that needs to be separately compiled, because templates go in headers in general. Um, if you need to separately compile something, std function can be put in that signature. If something needs to be a virtual function, uh, for technical reasons, you cannot have a virtual template. Um, so if you have a virtual function, you can make it take a std function of a specific signature, and then it can be called with any callable object of whatever type. And like I showed you, container elements all need to be the same type. Um, std function can help you have containers of std functions. So very surprising gotcha, I would say, that std function requires copy constructible function objects. And this is kind of unusual. In the STL, usually the STL is lazy in the sense that it doesn't need things up front. If I have something like a list, and the way I think about it, this is powered by a core language rule, if I have something like a list of t, t does not need to be less than comparable. Uh, it can be, that's fine. But in general, it does not need to be less than comparable. Only if you call the member function list t sort, then it actually does need to be less than comparable if you call it by default. Um, and the core language rule that powers this is that the definitions of member functions of a class template are not instantiated until they're actually needed. Uh, the bodies don't exist in some sense until you actually call them. And this is usually cool. Um, this means you only pay for what you need. Um, but std function is special because this type erasure. Um, because when you construct a std function from some callable object f, it needs to generate everything it could ever need from that object f because it's going to erase its type. It requires all of the operations that it could possibly ever need regardless of if they're used. So if you construct a std function fr from some callable object f, f is absolutely required at compile time to be copy constructible. And this is true even though f will be moved into the std function. So even if you give it an r value, and even if you never copy std functions anywhere in your program, f is still required to be copy constructible. Uh, you'll get a compiler error saying so, maybe horrible, maybe nice, depending on what you get. It just cannot store movable only function objects. This is a design limitation caused in part by the fact that std function dates back to boost and tr1 before our value references. Um, and in some sense, it can never be fixed with std functions interface as it stands. Alternatives are being investigated. Maybe we can cram something else in the type or have a different movable function. Um, so we will probably get some sort of type erased wrapper that can store a movable only function in the future, but std function as it stands in CS17 right now cannot do that. So just be aware. Std function's got this trick called the small functor optimization. So think about what it does. Std function of a given signature has to be some specific size. Let's say it's, you know, 50 bytes or whatever. Um, but the callable object that I give to it could be arbitrarily large. I could store a gigantic std array in my callable object or whatever, or a zillion pointers. So how are we going to cram that into the std function? Um, well, the answer is eventually we're going to use dynamic memory allocation. At some point, we've got to say operator new, allocate some memory, and then have a pointer to that memory. But allocating memory is, in general, somewhat expensive. Um, so std function has a trick. And this trick is permitted by the standard and actually required in one case. If your callable object is small enough, 
that can be stored within the std function object itself without a dynamic memory allocation. It can simply be placement nude constructed within a properly aligned buffer, and we store a pointer to it, and we don't allocate memory in any circumstance. So that's good. Uh, the standard guarantees sort of indirectly by saying shall not throw exceptions um, that this happens if a std function stores a built-in function pointer or if it stores a reference wrapper. If you have a callable object of any other type, even a pointer to member function, you're not guaranteed to get the small functor optimization. It's up to the implementer's judgment as to whether they activate it. And as we'll see on the next slide, uh, implementations do vary in what they accept. There's also one additional bit that is not outright specified by the standard, but implied by its requirements. And that's, if you want to activate the small functor optimization, your callable object must be no throw move constructible. And the reason why this is implied is that swapping std functions is required to be no accept. Think about what this implies if you have locally stored function objects. I need to move the first std functions callable object into some buffer somewhere, move the other one, and then move the first one in. And if those can throw, then the swap would be able to throw exceptions. That would be bad. So your callable object must be no throw move constructible to activate the small functor optimization. Here I've got a slide. I can observe through a test case what activates the small functor optimization. So in VS 2015 on x86, stood function is 40 bytes big. And it can store a callable object that's no throw move constructible up to and including 32 bytes. Anything bigger will cause a dynamic memory allocation. And on x64, the std function is bigger, it's 64 bytes, and it can store up to 48. Uh, now, we chose these numbers um, in VS 2015 uh, using the heuristic, I should be able to store a callable object like a lambda that's bound one std string. That seems reasonable, so I'm gonna make the small functor optimization at least as big as a std string. And I've put std string size up there for comparison. I've also put libcs pluses and libstdcs pluses values there. I observed that libcs plus also can store a std string in, in its small functor optimization, but libstdcs plus cannot, and that's just due to the constants that they've chosen. Uh, that heuristic was suggested to me by James McNellis, our CRT maintainer. I asked, hey, you know, how big should the small functor optimization be? And he said, hey, a std string. I was like, that sounds good, I'll do that. In 2013, it was very small. <laughs> Like, yeah, we chose it through a highly rational, you know, data science, we get lots, no, no, we just make up an idea and go with it. Um, okay, so std function I mentioned, it learned a couple tricks in CS plus 14, um, you know, or one trick in CS plus 14. In CS plus 11, this code was ambiguous. If I overload meow, uh, taking a std function, taking one int and returning an int, versus taking two ints, if I call it with lambdas with different signatures, in CS plus 11, this was ambiguous and would fail to compile. CS plus 14 can disambiguate, and that's because std function's constructor um, is now constrained to exist only if the callable object is callable with that signature. Um, there's a bit in the standard that says that, but basically it means that this code compiles, which is kind of what you would expect, but in 11 it did not. In CS plus 17, just voted in, um, it also learned another trick. If I have a std function that returns void specifically, I can now store a function object. Here I've got a lambda that returns an int. Um, I can now store a function object that returns something, and that will be discarded. Um, essentially, if I can always call a function to ignore its return value. std function is now capable of this. Hooray. Um, the reason why this didn't work in CS plus 14 is it said std function took the return type of the stored callable object and implicitly converted it to the specified return type of the std function. Um, turns out, according to the core language, you cannot implicitly convert something to void. That's just how it works. But, like I mentioned, the standard library can make up its own rules. So they voted in a rule saying, hey, we can convert this thing to void, why not? Um, package task uh, also learned this trick and bind arm, which I won't go into. Um, now, std function is complicated enough that there's actually a couple issues with it that are issues in the standard that have not yet been resolved. And I want to mention them for completeness. First, as the committee has discovered to its horror, std function is not super awesome when it comes to multi-threading in a specific sense. std function's function call operator is const. Because if you call a std function, it doesn't mutate its own state. Um, it can just call the function object's function call operator. The problem is, the way it's specified, std function's const function call operator can call a non-const function call operator on the stored callable object, even though it usually behaves like the value type. And the reason this compiles is because it really stores a pointer to the callable object, even if it lives within itself. Turns out that this violates, in some philosophical sense, the STL's multi-threading guarantees when it comes to const. 
usually the STL says, if the user obeys these principles, I will obey them too, and const means thread safe. std function subverts that. That's kind of bad. The committee is looking into ways to fix that. Um, another thing um, that we have discovered is that because std function wraps a callable object, it essentially exposes a deficiency in the core language. If I have a callable object that returns something by value, like meow returns a std string, I can wrap that in a std function whose signature returns const string ref. That const string ref that the std function returns will be bound to the std string that meow returns by value. But that evaporates as soon as the std function's function call operator returns. So you immediately get a reference to a dangling temporary. At least compilers will often warn, but this code, which is required to compile by the standard, should not compile. I think I can fix this in the standard. I need to write the library issue. But it's not trivial. In this case, it's trivial because the type is the same. But in general, uh, reference binding is really wacky. I need to figure out exactly the core language standard is to hook into. So my recommendations for std function. It is super awesome. The type erasure trick that it does and the small functor optimization and all the other stuff it does, it's really, really great and super nasty to write by hand. So definitely use std function, but only use it when you need it. I've seen people go crazy with std function when they don't. If you're writing something like an algorithm that accepts some arbitrary thing, it should probably be a template. And with invoke now, you can write such a template that accepts arbitrary callable objects. Um, you're, you'll be templated on the callable object type. You won't be storing it anywhere. You'll just directly invoke it. Things will be great. Or if at local scope you're storing something like a lambda or maybe a call to bind, you should use auto to make the type of the function object the same as the type of what it's initializing. You don't need std function from that. You only need it when you need that type erasure trick or something like I need to store a std function and then maybe later assign it to be something else that's a different type. Um, std function is useful there. It has non-zero costs and people often don't appreciate this. Um, usually the STL is like zero overhead essentially or negative overhead. Uh, std function though, because of the fact that it needs to do type erasure, it prevents inlining because it's going through the moral equivalent of a virtual function call. Um, it also has space costs. We're going to have that small functor optimization buffer regardless of whether your function object is smaller than it or if it's too big and needs to be dynamically allocated. You pay that space cost regardless of whether you use all of it. And also the type of ratio trick needs a couple pointers and you're paying that. Um, also, um, template, code bloat, template code bloat, I'm going to say it's a myth. I have almost never seen it matter in practice. Templates instantiate just what you have written by hand. The one time I've seen template code bloat be an issue in practice is when somebody went crazy with std function and used it all over the place. One of the reasons why this is an issue is because st std function emits code, like stuff needed to copy and move the and swap the underlying function object regardless of whether you actually call it. So that's a cost. It makes your binaries bigger. Um, so if you do use std function, take into account all that I've said, you should still use it efficiently. It's a somewhat heavyweight object, so you don't want to copy it unnecessarily. You also don't want to move it unnecessarily, and you don't want to make temporaries for no reason. Only construct things when you really need them. It's kind of like a std string, but a little more expensive. So uh, more info, I promised at the beginning, um, all this stuff has been implemented in VS 2015 with a couple exceptions. First, uh, because VS 2015 does not support expression sphene in the compiler, uh, we have not implemented the result of and function sphene, and I have refused to use library-only tricks to do it in the absence of compiler support. At some point in the future, we will get that in the library, but currently we're following the 11 rules that say that result of is double colon type does not sphene away, and std function does not have the disambiguation trick. Um, also, while I rewrote functional uh, to purge all the bugs in there, the multi-threading headers use the stuff slightly incorrectly. Async uses bind, it really shouldn't. Package task uses to function and hence requires copy constructability, it really shouldn't. Um, and also, I tried to be sneaky in memfun to handle non-standard calling conventions. I thought surely nobody will notice that my template arguments don't exactly match what's in the standard. <laughs> Inevitably, somebody noticed and filed a bug. Um, I've fixed that already for update one, and that will ship, so I'll follow the standard uh, strictly. And I've included a link there uh, to the CS17 working paper. So, okay, looks like we've got seven minutes left. Uh, let's take some uh, questions. Uh, do we have microphones set up? No microphones. Okay, so I will just go left to right. Question there. I've used this in the context of boots in the past to various compiler issues. Okay. 
Uh, yes, I would say there are there may be minor differences between uh, Boost and uh, the standard library, but in general, the Boost interface, especially if you're compiling it in CS plus 11 mode with a new compiler, uh, should behave very much like this. I believe in a couple cases, Boost has added extensions um, that the standard library does not have. I need to go look it up. Um, but the vast majority of stuff will port over. Now, Boost has probably not learned the very recent tricks, um, like the conversion to, actually, we might have had the conversion to void bit. Um, I would have to go look that up. Um, but like the result of Sfine, um, I'm sure Eric Niebler has checked that into Boost, so almost everything should work with Boost. Uh, other questions? Yeah, there. Okay. Yep, slide 18. Right. Okay. The, to detect if something's called, yeah. Yeah, the, the question is um, with the library fundamentals, void, uh, the, the detection idiom, void T sort of thing. Actually, void T was added in CS17. Um, uh, is the result of more useful that you can detect whether something is callable? And I would say maybe we could still write the decal type by hand. I mean, the, ultimately, it is just a syntactic convenience for this decal type invoke decal val thing. Um, but if you know the protocol that it uses, then feel free to use result of. Just be aware that the value category, like the L value reference or R value reference that you put in there, and the CV qualifiers matter. But if you're at that level of generic code, then result of is not evil. It's just, it requires skill to use properly, like a very dangerous chainsaw. And you said you had another question? Okay, um, let, let's take other questions, I'll come back to you. Any other questions? Yeah, over there. Right, change the behavior, yeah. Yeah, change the behavior Yes, it's just, it's just, the question is, what about movable only function objects? And the answer is, it's a design limitation. The standard library has no type erased wrapper for a move only function objects. You can write your own, you can write wrappers that sort of hijack it into std function, like you could write something that is copyable, but if you try to copy construct it, it throws. std function will happily throw that, or happily store that, and won't throw if you don't copy it. Um, but it's subverting the type system a little. Um, like, like I said, something will probably propo be proposed for the standard in the future, but it has no support for that right now, just like it has no support for, say, parsing XML or something. It may show up in a library fundamentals TS first. Um, I don't think it would make 17 at this point. There's still a couple years out, um, but there's no concrete proposal yet. It's just the committee has been talking about what would it look like to have a movable only function wrapper. Uh, other questions before I come back? Yes, ask away. Uh, yes, um, we're still using Dinkmore standard library. I just take in uh, PJ Plowger's functional header, um, which I had been maintaining over the years, and I ripped out almost everything except for the skeleton stood function and rewrote it all over the process of about four months and then shipped the changes uh, back. And it, the old implementation, it was extremely good back in the TR1 era. I could not have written it um, before we had decal type and perfect forwarding um, and before variadic templates. Um, but as Things evolved in CS plus 11 and 14. Uh, the code was extremely difficult to maintain and extend uh, as new features were voted in. So that's why I rewrote it from scratch using an actual std invoke that had perfect forwarding, decal type, and all that, and purged all the bugs. Okay. So I found a defect in uh, the Dinkware library with enable shares in this. Uh, I found a replacement right. before, but I, I saw that it also compiled the breaks under the Microsoft. Yes, please submit a bug. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you can also file bugs through uh, connect or send a smile, but talking to me is fine too. Yeah, 
Uh, another question there? Yeah. Uh, um, the question is how to write things that take lambdas. If you're writing the algorithm, you could follow the STLS convention of taking function objects by value. The reason why I did that in 98 is so you could accept things that had either const or non-const function, function call operators. But you could also write it to take callable ref ref. This would be like std shuffle. And that takes the thing in place and then invokes it. And if you want to be real cool, you would say forward callable to respect the original value category. Um, going forward, I'd say that's probably the right thing to do if you don't need to copy the thing. Um, even if, yeah, if you call it, then you would obviously not say it stood forward. But then if you took callable ref ref, you'd be saying, I accept an arbitrary thing, and then I'm going to call it multiple times. That would be acceptable, I would say. Um, that may be the new convention going forward. It's usually not a good idea to just randomly violate standard library conventions, but in this case, it was due to a CS plus 03 limitation. Uh, it looks like our time is up. We're at 10. Um, so I'll be around all week. Please come to me and ask any other questions you have. Uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>